Our next talk is by Dr. P.K. Thomas. He'll, he'll be speaking to us on um, interstitial lung disease. And I think he'll be touching a little bit on helping people quit smoke along with that. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much for those kind words of introduction. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here this afternoon. Um, I thank um, Dr. Gauri Shankar and his associates for having given me the opportunity to be here. It's been a pleasure to interact in this symposium on COPD. Uh, we now talk about one more chronic um, lung disease, which is interstitial lung disease, a disease that is very poorly understood in many, many parts of the world, even by the medical profession. And I think over the past five to 10 years, we've learned, about, learned a lot of things in IPF, like we learn a lot of things in life. And one of the most important things that we learn is not what to do. That's what we've learned in IPF today. If there's one lesson that we have learned to do in IPF today is that it's the sort of call of the obstetrician as such, you know, like watchful expectancy. You take your hands off and then you watch this patient and watch him and watch him and watch him again. And that's the best way of looking. That's probably the best way of looking at COPD as we, as, uh, uh, of IPF as we look at today. My own introduction to IPF I think is extremely interesting in the sense that um, I was going for my final year MBBS examination. I used to, we were at the um, Madras Medical College across from government, across from um, Central Station. There was this examiner from Andhra who had to catch a train at 5 o'clock. And I had the unfortunateness of having my, my viva at 4.45 in the afternoon. And this guy was very keen about crossing the road and catching the train. And he said, ah, I'll ask you only one question, only one question. If you answer this question, you'll pass. If you don't answer, you'll fail. He said, what is Hammond-Reed syndrome? I said, my God, what, <laughs> what the hell is this? I said, inter. And he said, oh, yes, fine. It's interstitial fibrosis. You know, like I could have said international for all, for all I know. And he would have still passed me. <laughs> that is the thing. But I think a lot of water has flown under the bridge since then. And we have now come to this state where we realize and understand that it's such a disease to treat. And there are so many entities that are attached to that. If you look at the causes of interstitial fibrosis, I think you look at this, this gives you a conglomeration of the causes you're looking at. You look at drugs, you look at collagen vascular disease, you look at pigeons, you look at all the other entities, look at um, um, uh, uh, dust and pollution, then you look at the x-ray as such. So we understand, we begin with William Osler, he's one of my real favorites as such. Death occurred about three months and a half after the onset of acute disease. The lung was two-thirds the normal size, grayish in color, hard as collagen, microscopic area shows advanced fibrotic changes and greater in great thickening at the alveolar walls. William Osler. Can anybody imagine what year this was set in? It was set in the year 1856. 1856. This is an autopsy from the great William Osler, which today tells you exactly what IPF is. And to understand that this was done 150 years ago is a fantastic thing. I often compare physicians like us who treat IPF like this, you know. I don't know whether there were three or the six blind men and the elephant. There were five, sir, or six? Five. Five blind men and the elephant. There are three blind men here who are trying to sort of figure out this elephant and holding him by the tail and whatever. The three guys here are the pulmonologist, the pathologist, and of course the patient as such. So these three guys are trying to figure out what this elephant, this big white elephant is probably trying to bring out. So we look at a lack of understanding of the disease. There is a lack of understanding. Lack of precise understanding of the diagnosis, the clinical criteria. Lack of understanding of treatment, the benefits versus risks, quality of life and survival. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look at this, the most important thing is really at the bottom here. What are the risks and benefits of treatment? What is the quality of life and what is the survival? How many of us talk to patients about these? We talk to patients about everything else including the football match that happened yesterday but we don't talk about this. We don't talk to patients about what is survival? What is life? What is end of life for that matter? Has anybody here spoken to patients about end of life care? What is end of life? What is this IPF patient going to do when he's going to end his life? He's going to die. And he's going to die pretty quickly. So we need to sit and talk to this guy about all these things and we need to understand that these things are extremely important. 
Now look at these years, these years are interesting, look at 1969, look at 1997 uh, and look at uh, uh, 97 again, you will find the same terminology existing, the usual interstitial pneumonia which is consistent with what we call IPF today, the fact does remain that we have known very little about this classification till maybe 2013 when they have been revised here. I am not going to show you the revised, I am going to show you the older version, but the revised version is a little better. If you need to look at it, I think you can go back to the guidelines of 2013 and they will tell you that there is a revised definition that will tell you that there are common IPFs and there are rarer IPFs. There are only two grades today that are present there. But then if you look at, this is the old definition that we really look at. You look at DPLD, diffuse pan chymal lung disease, you have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you have IIP other than pulmonary fibrosis, respiratory bronchiolitis, cryptogenic organizing, um, lymphocytic pneumonia, of desquamative interstitial fibrosis, acute interstitial pneumonia and non-specific interstitial pneumonia. So today basically we are looking at idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis which is consistent with the diagnosis of UPF like usual interstitial pneumonia. The other major entity is the non-specific interstitial pneumonias which have come into play. Then of course you have the respiratory bronchiolitis and the other things which are probably smoking related and now if you look at the new guidelines you will find that there is a real differentiation between these two things as we look at. But ultimately what is it all about and I think that is what we need to understand you know like um, they often used to say that if you are really confused about certain things you should go back to your vernacular. You should try to think in your vernacular you know one of my teachers used to tell me if you do not understand something go back to your vernacular. My vernacular is Tamil and so I will say the NDI, the what is this? It means that there are only two processes in patients with IPF. One is inflammation and two is fibrosis. That is it. There is nothing more to it than these two things as such. You have inflammation and you have fibrosis. And this is really what you get. You have an inflammatory response, unresolved inflammation. You have diffuse fibroblasts and then fibrosis. And then you have the fibrosis itself with, with honeycombing which is sort of the fibrotic pathway and you have the inflammatory pathway and that is important. So if you are looking at two entities that are present in patients with IPF, it, it, are, it, it is these two things. You either have a fibrotic entity or you have an inflammatory entity. Now this of course is from radiology if you really, if you really look at this. It is very interesting I got it from the radiologist as such. The, 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 the proposed alveolar injury in patients with IPF, you have a normal injury that heals abnormally as such. An abnormal sequence of wound healing leads to incorporation of organizing air of intraalveolar exudates and, and fibroblasts uh, resulting in a, a thickened alveolar wall and partial reepithelialization. So there is an abnormal repair, that is really what it is. There is an abnormal wound repair that you have in patients with IPF that is probably responsible for this is we would like to see that. So basically you are looking at an injury which could result in histologic lesions and all these other IPFs that we talked about and look at the thought of overlap that they have and that is really what I want you to understand. The whole confusion that we have had over the past so many years is probably related to the fact that there is so much overlap between these two things. We currently use an approach that recognizes frequent overlap amongst the IAPs that suggests that multiple histologic lesions may be identified in individual cases, the NSIP pattern of fibrosis can be found in patients with IPF. So we understand that there are multiple, multiple permutation combinations that we are looking at in these patients with IPF and we know that it is not a single disease, that it is multiple disease. So you have injury which can produce various diseases by themselves and then you have this conglomeration of NSIP, UIP and of course desquamative interstitial pneumonia as we really look at it. There are multiple ways of looking at this problem as such. Pathogenic mechanisms, particulates, chemicals, reflux, viruses, coagulation, cascades, antioxidant, fibronitic macrophages, then you have the, antifib the fibrotic mediators, antifibrotic mediators, then you have the EMT and finally you have extracellular matrix deposition. It is ultimately a sort of combination of all these things as such. And that is the reason why today there have been so many therapies with IPF that have been tried and all are negative. They have tried the anticoagulant, they have tried the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the histamine analogs, they have tried all sorts of things. They have not succeeded because we understand that there are multiple fibrotic processes that are acting but is ultimately a war out here in the middle between fibrotic mediators and antifibrotic mediators. The fibrotic mediators finally winning over 
and producing extracellular matrix deposition. So you have an injury, this is the original hypothesis, one injury producing fibrosis but today we understand that there could be multiple, there need to be multiple stimuli that are present here with genetic factors which are probably present with inflammation, Th1, Th2 and then of course the fibrosis. And we also understand there is another way of looking at this. You have multiple things, injuries, you can inhibit injuries with antioxidants, with all these other things that you are looking at, look at stimulation of the basement membrane, you have um, inhibition of uh, these um, um, cytokines, multiple inhibitors as such, VGEF, sildenafil. The reason why I put up this slide because there are so many ways that you can try and block this process of fibrosis that you are really looking at and that is the reason why you will find there are multiple therapies today. There are multiple therapies. There is NAC, there is azathioprine, there is prednisolone, there is perfenidone, there is nintidinib, which is, which is BIBF, well, uh, 1120, that is what it is. There are multiple drugs today and you will find there are huge number of failed trials in patients with IPF. NAC is one failed trial, Sildenafil is one failed trial, Bozentan is one failed trial, Ambrisentan is, is, is one failed trial, um, um, the, the IL-13 is such. There are a lot of things that have failed as such in patients with uh, imantinib is a failed trial. There are a lot of failed trials because we have tried to do things, a lot of things together where we think that we have tried to inhibit either of these, one of these things that we have not really succeeded as such. So we understand today the same thing is being sort of depicted at different level but we, we understand the tissue restoration and your anti -medi antibody mediated immunity, fibroblast activation, make matrix deposition and fibrosis. And we also understand that it is probably a TH2 overlay and that is very important today because lot of these uh, pharmacological entities are focused on the fact that you are probably looking at a TH2 overlay that is producing these things as such. So you find that if you look at interstitial lung disease by duration or symptoms, does the duration tell you something about the interstitial fibrosis by itself, acute onset days to weeks, acute interstitial pneumonia, acute pneumonitis from SLE, drugs, alveolar hemorrhage, eosinophilic lung disease, hypersensitive to pneumonitis. And I think it is a very important thing that we often look at in these patients. A hypersensitive to pneumonitis patient comes to you almost as an acute patient with a short duration of history. It is not like an IPF which is where breathlessness started long time ago then it slowly progresses over a period of time. You find that the time sequence are very different in these patients. Subacute to weeks, collagen vascular, drugs, subacute hypersensitive pneumonitis, chronic to months of course would be your IPF, collagen vascular associated ILD, non-specific interstitial pneumonia and occupation. So the question of duration of symptoms I think is absolutely vital to start a diagnosis of IPF. We need to understand how long your symptoms have persisted and what is the duration that you are really looking at. Then you look at <coughs> this of course a very very old one this is from uh, 2000 the major and the minor criteria I can you can just write this off today this is totally relevant. Risk factors again are age we talked about age, gender male but again this is again a, quest, a question mark against it, dyspnea moderate to severe with excession, cigarette smoking. There are two things that are very important these patients progressive dyspnea, progressive cough and of course you have history of cigarette smoking. You have these three in combination, I think you need to look for IPF and if you find a few RALs at the basis, which will be very classic when you put your stethoscope to that. If you have developed honeycombing, I think you can discover a honeycombing with a stethoscope and not with a CT scan. With a simple stethoscope, you should be able to pick up those velcro RALs which will tell you very clearly that you are probably dealing with. IPF. So we need to understand the history of cigarette smoking, lung function of course, look at bowel fluid and HRCT. These are more to rule out other things in case you are uncomfortable with things. The question of doing a, um, a transbronchial biopsy for all patients with ILD is no longer, is, is, is really no longer pertinent. There is no question about it at all. We have gone past that today. Today with HRCT, you can make a very clear diagnosis of IPF with a good HRCT. You do not need to go beyond a HRCT for that at all, even to prognosticate and say that there are, there are a lot of radiology scores that you can use in these patients which will tell you whether you are prognosticating an IPF or not. So I think that is again very important. Response to corticosteroids is poor, pathology, more fibrosis, more fibroblastic process. The response to corticosteroids of course depends on whether you are looking at the inflammatory pathway 
or the fibrotic pathway. And if you are looking at a fibrotic pathway, you would probably use less steroids and use them only when you have an exacerbation, where if you are looking at an inflammatory pathway, you probably use more steroids over, over a great duration of time and probably get the best results as a result of that. Then again, as I said, prevalence of serial decline at 6 months, DLC1, FEC. These are things that do decline over a period of time. This is where you begin. An IPF will begin like this. A very subtle X-ray. 90% of times you may sort of in your busy practice you may pass it off as normal. But if you look really at the basis you find, I am sorry. If you really look at the basis you find that there is a process of, of shading that is already starting here. Sort of interstitial shadows have already started appearing here. You take a CT and that is really what you are looking at. Now you are looking at an advanced IPF and you have an X-ray which is reasonably normal. And that is one reason why the minute you suspect IPF, for any reason if you suspect IPF, I think he goes straight for a HRCT without question. And I think that is very, very important because you will diagnose an IPF early and treatment modalities today are really, are really directed towards early diagnosis in patients with IPF. You look at, histolo uh, you look at radiologic findings, the honeycombing has already begun. This is probably an early IP that looking at multiple reticular shadows. You have traction bronchiectasis, you have multiple honeycombing that is, that is appearing here. You look at these x-rays, I think this again will tell you that there are multiple honeycombing shadows which are present, basal, subplural, which I think are extremely important. Always this honeycombing is basal, this honeycombing is subplural. There are two things that we need to very clearly understand. It is basal and it is subplural and it is important for us to realize that as well. So there are multiple things that you can really look at. IP have progressed in four years. This is a patient here, he started with this and you will find very early and then slowly and then he comes up to this object. I think we need to understand that the so called duration that we talked about at the beginning is absolutely vital. Now imagine this is a patient with 4 years and he's had IPF. This is the slow phenotype in IPF that you are really looking at. And you need to understand that there is not only a slow phenotype but also a very, very rapid phenotype. I had a lady who was off in 45 days. She had an x-ray which was absolutely normal 45 days ago, very, very little um, um, uh, basal shadows that she had. I did tell her she was e extremely breathless. She was breathless beyond any imagination that you could think about. She could not walk 15 yards and I told her you have to have something. I said you do a CT and you do a pulmonary angio as well. Just make sure that you sort of missed out anything. Now he was a guy who was not willing to listen. He came back 15 days later with a CT and you won't believe me what that CT was. She had full blown fibrosis. So we need to understand that there is a very rapidly progressive phenotype. And if you postpone a HRCT, I think you will miss that. And never forget that this Hammond Reed syndrome that I talked to you about, he had 12 patients and all 12 patients were dead in three weeks. Fourth week, all 12 patients were dead and that's the way we got into initial fibrosis in the first place. So please understand that there is a very, very clearly, rapidly progressive phenotype. There are also slowly progressive phenotypes. We'll look at that a little later. So this, of course, is chest PM, mild ground glass opacities. You're looking at um, um, histopathology, looking at histopathologic lungs. You find that there is a traction bronchiectasis that's beautifully visible here. You have multiple areas of temporal heterogenicity. You find that there is chronic inflammations, dense mature fibrosis and loose fibroblastic tissue. All these things going on side by side. And then you have UIP with its sagittal slice and look at the basal predominance. Please do not forget the fact that this is basal. You find that the apices are fairly clear. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, by base of down glass opacification. This of course, one minute, I think. Ah, uh, yeah. We look at MSIP and you will find that this is again almost like the IPF when you, when you started off. But you look at this X-ray here, the total lack of honeycombing that you are really looking at. Now this is inflammatory and there is this ground glass appearance that you are seeing all over. There is a wee bit of traction bronchitis that you are looking at here. This is a classical situation. We have bilateral ground glass opacities with subplural sparing. The subplural is spared. There is no honeycombing. And you find that this is probably NSIP, a very classic candidate for the use of exposure to steroids. And I think this is important that you understand that you are dealing with a fibrotic and a inflammatory pathway as well. If you look at NSIP, there is a cellular pattern 
and there is a fibrosing pattern. You will find that the recent guidelines have made this differentiation between cellular NSIP and fibrotic NSIP because fibrotic NSIP invariably behaves like a UIP and an IPF whereas the cellular NSIP is probably more responsive to steroids that you are really looking at patchy ground glass attenu attenuation and uh, so ground glass opacity fi uh, fibrosis findings common this is HRCT lower zone predominance basal peripheral predominance we have seen that already so key points would be um, um, NSIP you have a cellular NSIP and you have a fibrotic NSIP and you will find that then in NSIP there is inflammation and the most important thing is the lack of fibrosis and that is important whereas it is the other way around an IPF where you have more fibrosis and less inflammation NSIP you have more inflammation and less fibrosis and I think this is a very basic entity that you really need to look at when you are making this diagnosis as such and you look at acute interstitial pneumonia I think this is like ARDS really massive fluffy shadow that you are really looking at I do not honestly think that you would miss this at any cost extensive airspace consolidation and there is of course ground glass appearance Inter acute interstitial pneumonia you find that this is bilateral ground glass airspace consolidation architectural distortion combination of the first three findings consolidation predominantly basilar and dependent you saw the 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 ALI in the morning today and I think all those shadows were dependent shadows and we need to understand that this is something equal that you are really looking at this is of course a respiratory bronchiolitis associated ILD you find these multiple conglomerate opacities that you are really looking at you find that there some of these are subplural but invariably you will find that there is no honeycombing as such there is no huge um, ground glass appearance as you really look at it numerous poorly defined centilobular nodules were very cl classically characteristic of patients with ILD so I think it is the same thing that you really get I think this is important that you find that there is a, a combination of things that you really need to look at if you look at the percentages of diagnosis of IPF if you have only a pulmonologist you add a, pul a, a clinician you add a radiologist and you add a pathologist to that you get the best diagnosis so I think if you have a multidisciplinary team which makes a diagnosis of IPF or at least you have a very good correlation very good rapport with your pathologist you can go and sit with your uh, radiologist you can go and sit and talk to him you will probably make a much 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 better diagnosis of IPF I think that is again very important so therapies IPF triple drug therapy <laughs> impact of appropriate diagnosis you have IPF and you have non IPF IPF today triple drug therapy harmful antifibrotic drugs question mark Lung, tra lung transplantation not possible in this country but you can attempt clinical trials very few MCI is sort of literally closed down the clinical trials today and you will find supportive care which is I think very vital we will talk about supportive care a little later on non IPF of course you have corticosteroids immunosuppressive therapy lung transplant generally not really necessary so ultimately you have this balance that you really need to have accuracy of clinical diagnosis accuracy of HRCT diagnostic yield to biopsy mortality mortality of the biopsy consistency of pathologic interpretation and that is really what you are looking at in these patients the challenge of treating IPF is that survival is extremely poor that is the most important thing survival is extremely poor in IPF IPF mortality is increasing there is irreversible disease IPF mortality is comparable to that of cancer and I think this is a very very good thing that we are really looking at I was in a meeting that was talking about this great drug called chrysotinib which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that is used for ALK positive NSCLC you know and I final question I asked the oncologist was how much is your life expectancy increased if you use chrysotinib which costs about 90,000 rupees a month and need to use it for life 90% of us cannot afford that so I asked him how long is it going to improve life expectancy he hesitated looked up and down at me and then finally said five months so IPF is like cancer please understand that and I think that is something that we need to tell our patients because they do not understand we do not understand in the first place and how can you expect them to understand so I think the best comparison would be to tell him that he has something like a cancer for which there is no direct treatment and your treatment is only supportive that is really what you can do 
be utterly honest with this chap and I think that's the way you need to look at it. You know, after all the talking, this finally fellow will come around and ask you in the vernacular, sir. That's really what you will get. And the vernacular will hit you. Absolutely hit you. Because you are very sensitive to your vernacular. I think it is important that we make this differentiation, help people understand that it is an untreatable disease. And that's really what it is. You're looking at survival curves, NSIP versus UIP. Gauri, this is gone for a six, I think. Oh, yeah, done. Thank you. So, survival of patients with IPF, definitely no question about it. You have RBILD and all those things have a much better prognosis compared with IPF. We are all aware of that. I do not think we okay. delayed pulmonary fibrosis, time from onset of dyspnea, survival and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I think there are so many things alone. Management of IPF in expert centers, corticosteroids alone or in combination, immunosuppressive therapy alone or in combination, N-style cysteine alone or in combination. Look at the percentage of patients and you find no other therapy was approved, perfluoridone not yet available. And you find therapeutic approach is really talking about these things as such. We will talk about perfinidone a wee bit. The other things are really not worth, worth talking about because today we find triple drug therapy, definitely no benefit. You have antioxidant agents that you have been using for a very long time. None of these are really very successful. The NS style cysteine trial. Finally, Ganesh Raghu has accepted that the NS style cysteine is useless. You have um, May 2014. Um, NEJ, I am talking about NS style cysteine and COPD, and there is an article on NS style cysteine and IPF as well. We understand the agents that block adenosine molecules, inhibitors, specific fibrosis, nothing really seems to be working. This is the old ATS recommendation of triple drug therapy prednisolone, azathioprine, and cyclophosphamide, and that is the old therapy, totally unapproved, absolutely no indication today. 200 percent, there is no indication today. As I said in life, the first thing that we need to understand is what not to do. This is something that we should not do and we need not do at all. So we understand that the classical drugs used for treatment targeted a very broad spectrum of diseases and today you have what is called targeted therapy that you are really looking at. You know with the oncologist and, and chrysotinib, sorry, he gave me the impression that with chrysotinib he was sort of hitting the cancer cell, you know like targeted, segmented therapy and those were the words that he was using and finally he had a survival of five months and that's really what it's all about. So today th that's the therapy that we're looking at, looking at targeted therapy, we're also looking at gene therapy, multiple genes that have been inhibited here, we're looking at a lot of th these things as such. So treatment of IPF is very interesting in the sense that the BTS 2008 probably gives you the simplistic approach to IPF. Clinical features, probably uh, IPF, uh, fibrotic NSIP, no specific therapy, no strong recommendation for high dose steroids, prednisolone not recommended at all, prednisolone acetyprine, very weak recommendation, need further evidence, prednisolone 2008. We have come some way from that, probable IPF, fibrotic NSIP, again we have very weak recommendations for that. The Panther study with IPF, this was the one that really started the NAC with the uh, but but look at the year. I think the year is very interesting. This is 2012. Original star article with the Panther study showing that combination therapy was slightly better as from from uh, placebo. You find that it really did not work as such. In the midst of all this, I think we need to understand that we don't know. You know, I I, I saw this lady for the first time in the year 2009. She was diagnosed in 2006 with IPF in a corporate hospital and she was told that she will live six years, she can write her will and sign it. Six years is all she has got and she was sent home. This lady, uh, very strongly devoted Catholic, dumped everything in the waste basket, went to church and said, God will heal me. No treatment at all. From six, 2006 to 2009, she comes to me in 2009, absolutely fine. With great, great, great difficulty, the family brought her to me. And I took a look at her and she was totally fine, excellently, elegantly dressed, very comfortable at dress and no problem at all. I took one look at the CTs and got a heart attack. Look at the 2006 CTs, already started the fibrosis I think. 
already started the fibrosis and you look at the 2009 CTs, I am sorry, the 2006 CTs are above, 2009 CTs are below, you will find that there is hardly any prognosis, no treatment, no treatment at all in between, absolutely no treatment. She was teaching the kids at home, going back in school from school and school and home and she was perfectly normal. So I think we need to understand that there are a lot of things that we don't know. One of the things that we don't know is that this disease does not progress in some people. Why? God knows. I don't know. Nobody knows. And that is the reason why I think caution is very, very important here. And constant reappraisal of what you are doing, I think, is extremely important. We look at progression in ILDs, look at this progression for example. In this lung disease, connected tissue disease with rituximab. I think this is an important thing by connective tissue disease, there is a clear level of tolerance. Now this is the revised classification I was talking to you about. You have major IIPs which is IPF, NSIP, respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial disease, desquamative disease, rare IIPs, look at idiopathic interstitial idiopathic, idiopathic lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, look at the other things, unclassifiable, they have put down one thing is unclassifiable, inadequate clinical radiologic or pathologic data. This is of course from 2013, it's in the press at that point of time. This is what I meant when I said that we have multiple progressive variants, multiple variants of progression and that's really what we are looking at. You have a subclinical period, you have a pre-diagnostic period and you have a post-diagnostic period and look at the number of progressive progressions that we really look at. Look at the number of each of these ones is probably a different phenotype that we are really looking at. So there are phenotypes in ILD and you do not need to presume that every single of your patients will die like Hammon Reach's patients in about 3 weeks to 4 weeks. I gave you that example of this 5, 6 year prog no, no progression at all in this lady and I think it is important for us to really understand that. So. You can have inflammatory disease which is reversible and self-limiting, drug induced, excellently responsive to steroids. You give them steroids and look at the CT there. Then you can have potentially reversible but progressive disease. You have hypersensitivity induced pneumonitis, you have this potentially reversible but it is not really reversed at all. You will find that there is progressive fibrosis that is really starting up here. Then you have potentially reversible but progressive disease that goes into something like IPF and finally you have progressive irreversible disease which again is IPF right from the beginning with classic honeycombing. So every entity has a clear radiological pattern that, that, that follows and I think once we pick up this sort of radiological scent as such, we will be in a much much better position to understand where we are looking at. So fibrotic and inflammatory is really what you are looking at, corticosteroids, Immunotomodated, currently there is no evidence at all in these things. And I think uh, uh, ATS ERS as such, new diagnostic guidelines, negative steps, um, step IPF, Sildenafil, BUILD, Bozentan, Artemis, Ambricentan, Panther, um, Warfarin, CNTO. These are the negative trials that I told you about. All these trials are negative <coughs> because they thought that they, could that they could target one of these multiple pathways that were available. So you look at a recommendation, a strong recommendation, weak recommendation, weak recommendation for and a strong recommendation against and you look at a drug like perfiridon for example, NAC NAC which is now here at a recommendation which is weak recommendation which is weak recommendation um, um, for that's really what it is, that's really what you what, what, what you are looking at and you look at the year that this is 2011 and you will find Triple therapy no longer effective in patients. What we should not do in IPF? Triple drug therapy, no, no, no indication. Stop therapy. Patient treated for six months, stable disease, inform patient, continue query. Six months with, with stable disease, stop triple therapy. Greater than six months with progressive disease, again stop triple therapy. Patients with unclear diagnosis, you better do, don't do anything, just keep quiet and watch and wait. I think this is the ACE trial again which is an AC inhibitor trial and you will find that the anticoagulant effectiveness trial in patients with IPF, a negative trial, Ambricentan again is a negative trial that we are really looking at. So evident based recommendation idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, this was one year ago after perfenidone and this is of course the ASCEND trial that you are really looking at perfenidone, 
you find that perfenidone in these very very high doses of almost 2400 milligram does have what is called um, disease free survival. Now that is really what it is disease free survival benefit in these patients there is a benefit that you are looking at you are looking at uh, changes in FVC looking at other changes as such in these patients with with perfenidone at 4 years and 6 years and that is really what it is all about. So this is progression free survival and overall survival and you find that the capacity 1 and the capacity 2 which were the initial trials with perfenidone show that there is a small favorability with perfenidone as such when you compare with placebo. The problem with perfenidone I think is that 90 percent of these patients with IPF were used perfenidone when there was advanced idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis when they had already developed honeycombing and that was the, that was the time when they, re, they really introduced because they used honeycombing as a criteria to make a diagnosis of IPF. I think the problem with perfenidone could be the fact that we are probably not using it earlier I am using the word probably because I am not very sure but very likely we may benefit with perfenidone if we use perfenidone a little earlier in these patients before they do develop real fibrosis as such and that is what it is you compare NSCLC with IPF and you are almost looking at the same tree looking at the same tree you are looking at the same survival. So please understand that we need to get patients to understand this the benefit of risk therapy and I think it is very very important unresolved issue would be when to start we understand today that it would be better to start early rather than late and so what has happened to this um, um, recommendation with perfenidone you find that perfenidone has been pushed from a weak to a strong from a weak to a strong so there is a definite indication to try and use perfenidone in these patients and try and use them early rather than late currently recommended to treat patients with perfenidone early treatment with N-acetylcysteine may be considered in some patients with confirmed diagnosis but today again we have multiple trials that are sort of against perfenidone as we so you see that. So weak no we have already seen this I think we will skip this. So lung transplantation again as I said um, a very very clear entity abroad there is no question that if you are living abroad there is a clear entity for lung transplant of course there is a huge waiting list that you really need to follow but I think it is something that can very very seriously consider in these patients. Uh, perfenidone clinical trials we have already seen that. Now this is a drug that is being talked about at the ATS meeting um, in May and I think the whole of the ATS was full of this drug BIBF1120 and I think <laughs> be saying it in your dreams as such. Now the point really is that with this drug which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor like crisotinib it is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor they found that everything improved. There are two trials with this thing I think I just forget the name of this. I, uh, uh, I will sort of remember it sometime and tell you. There are two trials one and two with uh, uh, nintanidib which is BIBF1120 found that everything improved. FVC improved, uh, your 6 minute walk distance improved, your progression free survival improved. The only thing that you did not uh, improve is your death rate. That did not come down at all. That really stuck at the same levels. And today they are talking about this drug as a sort of next wonder drug that you are really looking at patients with the uh, patients with IPF. So we need to understand that whatever literature tells us we need to sort of filter it through this brain of ours and try and find out what is suitable for my patient we need to understand that very clearly. So rationale of course we have already seen that efficacy of a tyrosine kinase in pulmonary fibrosis annual rate of decline in FVC we have already seen that change in FVC from baseline over time incidence of exacerbations I believe came down with BIBF1120 look at about 50 milligram twice daily I think is the dose that they used yeah that is it QID you will find change in SGRQ scores in patients with BIBF 1120 and you will find that the nidantinib trials impulses was the name of the trial impulses 1 and impulses 2. So these are novel targets that you are really looking at in these patients there is some talk about um, 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 stromidix especially from STX 100 there is definitely some some, 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 to some talk about that uh, BIBF of course is from Boringer is really in phase 3 and probably will be out over the next 3 to 4 years be really looking at that. So associated conditions and I think this is something that all guidelines really um, uh, sort of con conglomerate on please treat the gastroesophageal reflex there are various trials to tell us that there is a definite gastroesophageal reflex in these patients 
and the combination of, of, of prokinetic and the PPI would be a very ideal adjuvant that you can use in these patients. If you look at emphysema, you're probably looking at a poorer prognosis. Look at pulmonary hypertension, like Sir was talking about pulmonary hypertension. Identify pulmonary hypertension because pulmonary hypertension and IPF is at least three times more common than in patients with COPD. So we need to understand that a cardiac evaluation is extremely important, heart and coronary disease, the sleep disordered breathing, if you're looking, a lot of these patients have coexistent OSA because of their immobility, they become obese and they have coexistent OSA as such. GER should be treated. Yes, it should be treated. There is no question about it. So combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema syndrome, we talked about the emphysema syndrome in COPD. There is also a very clear emphysema syndrome that you find in patients with IPF and always the presence of emphysema means that you have poorer lung function. It is important for us to understand no specific treatment for CP, cardiac output, uh, the mean PAP, Rosica Guat for interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension, a pilot trial, the PVR seemed to come down, the mean PAP seemed to come down as well, but then again these are drugs that are there. This is one trial with thrombomodulin and mycophenolate moxitil you find all of these are basically negative trials, drug transplantation, uh, definite, definite index of lung transplantation but the question is that whether you have the facilities to go through with it and the cost to go through with it as well. So care of the IPA patient, disease managed uh, sentiment, education, self-management, symptom-centered management, dyspnea, cough, fatigue, deconditioning, depression. Please ask these patients to exercise like these patients with COPD. We talked about pulmonary rehab and please provide patient, provider, patient partnership. I am the provider. I am the provider for my patient and I need to have a partnership with this patient where he should be able to get back to me and I should be able to get back to him and we need to sort of walk this journey together because this man is going to his death and we know that we need to walk with them together. That's the best that we can do. We can't really cure him of his disease. We can't do too many things for him. The best thing that we can do is to be sympathetic towards these patients and understand their problems and try and see what best we can do in this direction. So there are IPF directed therapies and there are palliative therapies. There is of course education and self-management and there is disease progression in the middle. And of course the onset of IPF and finally of course death as we said, IPF is like cancer. So suspected IPF, you please get a HRCT as quickly as possible. IPF, surgical lung biopsy, very questionable today. I will be very skeptic about a surgical lung biopsy. Multiple, multiple, multidisciplinary decision, not IPF, then you treat otherwise, practical management, we have already seen this, I don't think we would go into it. There are a lot of RCTs that are going on. If you can put them onto an RCT, the randomized clinical trial, I think it would be good because I think he would have the best care and the best therapy including supportive therapy. So we already talked about this, listening is wanting to hear. Please sit and listen to your patients and they are the ones that teach you, they are the ones that feed you as well. So I think we need to understand, we need to sit and talk patients, talk to patients, detailed discussion of prognosis and treatment complications. And again, we'll come back to this elephant and the three men. The good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. One minute before we finish, this gentleman is associated with this tiger. Anybody wants to give a name to him? This is Tiger Patowdy. Yes, you are right. Yes. We will dedicate this to him. Tiger Patowdy was one of the greatest Indian cricketers who ever lived. And more than anything else, he was a good man. Let's dedicate this to him. And thank you very much for the patience. In taking up the study of disease, you leave the exact and certain for the inexact and doubtful and enter a realm in which to a great extent the certainties are replaced by possibilities. We go back to the old William Osler the old wise man of medicine. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Thank you, sir, for... I think there's a definite uh, hypoglycemia. I think we'd sort of get the blood sugars right first. Give this Thank you very much. Thank you all. Now I request our chief medical officer in charge, Dr. Mahalashmi, to give us a vote of thanks. I wish to thank the experts for sharing their knowledge yesterday and today. And uh, I have uh, to thank our coordinators, uh, 
Dr. Rajagopalan and uh, Dr. P.K. Thomas. Uh, we thank our deans, director and registrar. I wish to thank Dr. Rebecca, Dr. Tenral, Dr. Gauri Shankar, Dr. G uh, Saraswati, Dr. Porchelvi and Dr. Sabita for organizing this and taking care and of the hospital and supporting us here. And I wish to thank the hospital crew. Last but not the least, we have to thank our German Remedies uh, for sponsoring our catering needs. And uh, thank you, Mr. Durai. And thank you all. Uh, I wish to thank all delegates for sparing your weekends and being with us and uh, may making the best use of this service and knowledge sharing by all our experts. Thank you so much. Uh, we'd also like to thank the ICSR for the auditorium and also the people who helped us with the lights and mics. And a special thanks I should mention Dr. Gauri Shankar who has uh, put in all his efforts and he's been the backbone of Bridge 2014. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs>